Okay, welcome back. Um, so, hopefully, you got my email. I put up uh, two My Math Lab assignments that are due Wednesday at 10 a.m. Uh, the one, the first one, is stuff that you could have been working on based on what we've done in class, and then the second one is going to be based on class today. Um, and then right now on the schedule. We have the first mastery exam this Thursday, but I'm trying to get that pushed back to next Monday because we're not quite, we need an extra day to make sure that you guys are ready. So what the mastery is, is we've been learning all about the closed form, these, these rules for closed form rate of change functions. And so the mastery exam is, is basically rapid fire, Do you, have you learned the rules, okay? So um, when, you, when you get into... Uh, future calculus courses and other math and engineering science courses, it's, it's just, um, it's nice when you come to problems just to know these, these rules so that you don't have to go look them up or get on graphing calculator and set up the, the open form and, you know, so it's just, it saves a lot of time to know these rules. So that's the motivation for having this called mastery exam of the closed form rate of change functions. But like I said, I'm going to try to get that, the first attempt is Monday. And then you have to get a certain, uh, we'll talk about it later, but you have to get a certain proficiency to have mastered it. If you don't get that proficiency, then you're taking it the next week also. Okay? So just master it the first time. Okay? And it, and it gives you, if you get the master, if you, if you get it, I think it's 80 or 85% correct on the first try, that counts as 100%. Okay? So it just gives you a score of 100% and it's worth half of an exam, half of an hour exam. If you don't get that proficiency the first time and you have to take it the second time, then you're starting at 90%, okay? But you still have to reach that mastery level. I'll explain more about that later. But uh, so right now we're just really focusing on the, the rules of these um, closed form rate of change functions. Okay, so two, map, two My Math Lab assignments due Wednesday at 10 a.m. Connor. Uh, no, you're just doing all on pencil and paper. It's in the testing center. It'll be it'll just be like a normal hour exam. You'll go on your own time to the testing center, and you'll be doing all on pencil and paper. Is there a time limit, or is it just the same? No time limit. No time limit. We'll talk more about it Wednesday. Okay. Other questions? So this is kind of this is th this slide here is an overview of where we left off last time. We talked about, we we're looking, this is x to the n, right? So this would be our open form rate of change. We've derived that. We know where that comes from. And then uh, this is, what is this? This is closed form approximate, approximate. And then this is open form exact and closed form exact. So remember, we said these are our open forms. Why? Because they reflect the process. What does this fraction mean right here? So what is the meaning of that fraction? You should know just the overall idea of, of that. Where did the, we spent time setting that up? Where, what is that? <coughs> okay, someone said rate of change. Tyler? Change of y over change in x, which is rate of change, right? So we're, we're starting from scratch to build a rate of change function change in y over change in x, or the size of changes in y relative to the sizes of changes in x, right? So those are our open forms, proximate, and it's exact when our interval gets very, very small, atomically small, 
Okay? And then here are our closed forms. So we got approximate and exact. Okay, so that's what we talked about the Friday before you left. And here's what we've, in terms of these closed form The closed form uh, rate of change functions, this is what we have so far. And then we also did oh, this is going to be on, doesn't it? OK. The other one we did was, this was a special case of what? Of any exponential function. And what was our rate of change of a to the x? A to the x, ln x. Right, a to the x, ln a. And what was the point of that? Remember, the point of that was that for an exponential function, the rate of change function, we showed Graphically, we showed that it's the original function. It's some we did it both algebraically and we showed it graphically. Um, but we showed that the rate of change function is the same as the original function times some constant, right? It's just a constant multiple of the original function. And when is that constant one? So when is that constant one, or when is the rate of change exactly the same as the original function? When a is e, right? When a is e. That was a very special function. Its rate of change function is the same as the original function. That's the only function in all of eternity and the universe that's like that, OK? A really special function. So we want to keep building on more. We need more rules. We need more of these rules because there's so many, um, so many functions you'll come across in future calculus courses, science, engineering courses. And so we need to build these rules, and then, we're, and then we'll have the mastery exam to make sure that you know them all and can apply them. <clears throat> okay, so the next we want to talk about is composite functions. We've seen an example of the use of composite functions this semester was a really important key idea that we needed to build up what accumulation from rate. What was, does anyone remember what, what composite function we built that we really needed? Or what a composite function is? Okay, something, something like that, function within a function. So when did we do that? Like we had our left and our mid and okay. whatever functions, but that was all within the rate functions. So okay. Left, okay, good. Remember doing this? R of left of x. This is an example of a composite function. It's not the only. I mean, so there's there's lots of, of applications of these in the world, but this is this is one that we saw as we were building up um, accumulation from rate. We saw that this was a, a key element to uh, getting accumulation from rate. Okay, so the idea is that what comes first, the rate function or the left function? Left. left comes first. What goes in to left? X goes in, and what comes out? Another X that was the, at the left side of the current interval, right? And then what, is that, what does this then suggest, or what does it represent in terms of what do we do with that left now we're going to put that into, yeah, so that's our left x. That's, that's the output of left x, but in this expression, it's also input into r, okay? And then what comes out? The rate at the x value that's at the left end of the current interval. So this is the idea of a composite function. It's two functions in succession. The output of one is then the input of the next. And that's how we represent it. And that's exactly what we did. We took the output of the left, we put it into R to get the rate at the left side of the interval. Okay? 
So you practice. So explain the process represented by g of f of x and draw an illustration. Go, practice. Okay, who can just explain it verbally? So explain what the process is. Yeah, Autumn. Um, so we'll take any x input and plug it into the function f of x. Okay. And then that will spit out technically the, the y value for f of x. Okay. The y value becomes the x value so you plug it into g of x. And then, one last thing. Yeah, that was all perfect. So, but then what's the... So did you hear what she said? That's perfect. She said, start with x, we're going to plug that into the f function, and that's going to spit out some output corresponding to the input x. She says she's going to call that the y value for f. And we're going to take that, and we're now we're going to put that into g. And that's going to be the input into g. And that's going to give us a corresponding output of g. And so your illustration, what function comes first? f or g? F comes first. What goes into F? X. What comes out? Yes. Yeah, so the output corresponding to when the input is X. And that's the output, right? F of X. And what do you do with that? Plug it into G. Okay. I'm going to do it like this. And what comes out of that? G of x? G of f of x. So, so this notation here, kind of, you can kind of see it in two ways. You can see it as that process that we're illustrating, okay, or what Autumn explained, or you can just see it as it also represents that output value, that output value when you get done with the process. You see, so it represents the whole process. It also represents that output value when you get done. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to practice seeing functions as composite functions. So it looks, it's just one function, but we want to be able to see it as, um, as a composite of two. So this one is not really a good example, so we're just going to skip over that one. But we'll do this one together and then I'll set you loose. So how can we see h of x, how can we see this as a composite function? So what we want to talk about is an, an interior and an exterior function, right? The interior function is the process that comes first. Its output is then the input of the exterior function or the outer function. So if we wanted to come up with, for this h of x, how could we rewrite h of x as g of f of x? So which comes first again? f comes first, right? So we're looking for an interior function here whose output then is plugged into an exterior function. Go ahead. For f, for f, he wants x cubed minus 5. As an interior function. Okay, so then what 
would g of x be, or what is the func the exterior function of this into which we're plugging x cubed minus five? He wants square root of x. So now the question is: Is g of f of x equal to h? Absolutely, right? Because the output of f is x cubed minus 5. Now we're making that the input into g. And we would get that right there. OK, so why don't you practice on the remaining four. So in terms of the reason we're doing this is cr critically important to recognize this. If we want to write the, the, um, the closed form of this function right here, it's going to be critical that you recognize this breakdown. Seeing it as a composite function allows you then, and we're going to find out how to get the closed form rate of change function for that. But you need to see the see it as a two-step process or see the inner and outer function. OK, the second one, I, it's hard to see. It's e to the 3x to the 8. OK, so you, you guys try these three. Work on these three together. Is there a question on h? Everyone, does it, does it make sense? Any questions on h of x? OK, so you work on the remaining three. Okay, so you can resist the temptation to study your quiz and keep your focus up on the workbook.
Really? Yeah. It is. Yeah, look up for a moment. I thought that was for your parents, though. That's not wrong. See, I just don't want to one in my life. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay, what is f of x for the px function? So let me just... So the first line will be the fx or the interior function, and then the second will be exterior. Interior function for e to the 3x to the 8th. 3x to the 8th. Should have gotten. What function is that being plugged into? E to the x. Okay? Question. Question. Uh, I don't know if you do this, but for f of x, I put e raised to the 3x, and then for g of x, I put f to the 8th. Is that incorrect? Mm hmm. There are, there are different ways to do some of these, but um, in terms of finding the rate of change function with the rule that we're going to derive, this is the way you want. You want to see this right there plugged into e to the x. How about this one? What's the interior function? Natural log of x. What is natural log of x being plugged into? 1 over x. Okay, this one. 1 over x is being plugged into sine of x. Okay, any questions? All right, so we'll come back to these, and we'll, we'll actually uh, find their, their closed form rate of change functions for each of these. So let's let's particular let's look at um, e to the one over x. So what was the rate of change function for e to the x? Just e to the x. So our hypothesis might be that r of h of x might be e to the one over x. So let's how can we check that? How can we see that if that's true or not? So we're, that's what we're asking the question. Since the rate of change of e to the x is e to the x. Is the rate of change of e to the 1 over x e to the 1 over x? That's our question. How could we check that? Okay, we could try to derive it. This, is, that was, this would be a really tricky one to derive. It would take some pretty uh, hefty algebra and probably some other tricks. So what's another way we could test Yeah. Now the, that's not what she was suggested. Using an open form, it's going to require some pretty tough algebra and some tricks to get through it. So, so what can we do? So we can do um, f of x equals e to the 1 over x. And then what? Y equals? Okay, we could graph that function. Okay. Now what? What's our goal? We're trying to figure out what? If? Yes, if it's if if the rate of change function is the same. How can we see? So we just make it calculate. No, we've learned it. You know how to do it. How will we do it? 
talk with the person next to you. We should all know how to do this. How can we check to see if the rate of change function is the same as that function? Should know. How many people think they know what, what you would do? Oh no. Yeah, all, uh, spring break, you were horizontal. It all fell out of your brain, right? Okay, Autumn, you're the first one to raise your hand. So what do you want to do? Is this a rate function? What, what, why do we use step functions from a rate function, right? So if this was a rate function, we would build a step function to get constant rates. But this is a, we're treating this like an accumulation function. We want the rates, right? So is that journey number one or journey number two? Journey number two. How do we, how can we graph, very easily graph the rate of change function? Sure. Tell me. Tell me. What do you want to call it? G. She wants to call the rate of change G. How about R? Okay. R equals F of X plus H. F of X. Okay. Are we ready to graph it? I mean, it, will, is this the rate of change function? Why not, Christina? What does it think it is right now? It thinks it's one. So, if we, what do we want to do? We don't need a slider. We just need h to be what? Really small, like what? How about that? Yeah, really, really small, right? And now what? Y equals? So we got the original function in red, and we got our rate of change function in blue. What do we think? Okay, so it's trying to graph the rate of change function here for this very small value of h. For that small value of h, if it were the same, it should, we sh they should be, if not right on top of each other, really close to each other, but they're not even close. Okay, so conclusion? Not the same. Not the same. Okay, and that's <clears throat> this e to the 1 over x. That's an example of a composite function, right? So it's when you have composite functions, there's something else, something else that we need to find the closed form rate of change. Okay. So what is that? So let's talk about that. I'm going to move it. Okay, so suppose that a function f has a rate of change function r of f. <coughs> suppose also r of f 6.1 equals 3.8. So the rate of change of the function f at x equals 6.1 is 3.8. What does that mean? Tell the person next to you. Should know. So we've been talking about this all semester long. What does that number 3.8 represent relative to the function f? Go.
Okay, there's there's many there's many ways there's many sides to to look at this from and talk about it. So anyone think they have one good way to express it? For it? Okay. So so after accumulation accumulating of uh, up to six point one, it's changing at a rate of three point eight. So my question is, what does that mean? It's changing at a rate of three point eight. What does that mean? What what can you talk about that in terms of say the quantities y and x? Yeah. That's really good. That's definitely what it means. Why is changing 3.8 times as fast as x? Okay. Everywhere? Just a, at 6.1, and we could say it's approximately, this is approximately true, very close to 6.1. But as soon as we move away, 6.5, 7, this might not be happening anymore, right? Okay. What's another way to express the meaning of this 3.8? terms of y and x. Or in terms of changes in, yeah, go ahead. Why is 3.8 times larger than x? What do you think about that? Is that true? Go ahead. Yeah, so given a change in x, given a change in x, Close to 6.1, what can you say? Tyler. Y is 3.8 times. Careful. What's 3. Point? Change in Y. Change in Y is? 3.8 Why am I saying approximately equal to? Yeah, close to. So we don't we don't know if we have constant rate of change of 3.8. If we had constant rate of change of 3.8 through the whole through a whole interval, then I could say equal. But it's just this is at a and for a very small interval close to 6.1, this kind of defines what's happening there. That changes in y are about 3.8 times changes in x. Okay? Here's a review. This means that if x moves a tiny bit from 6.1, the value of f will change approximately 3.8 times as much as we just said, right? Yeah. So, so I use delta y, but the output of the function is also called f. OK, don't worry about this. OK, so here's a new situation. So now there's two functions, f and g. OK? The rate of change of f at 6, at the point 627, is 5. OK? So changes in y are 5 times changes in x close to x equals 6. Are we good? For g, the rate of change of g is 3 at 2714, meaning that Close to x equals 27, changes in y are, are three times changes in x for the function g. So now what about the composite function g of f of x with respect to x at x equals 6? Okay, so at x equals 6, what are changes in f relative to changes in x at x equals 6? Changes in f relative to changes in x. 
five times greater. Agree? Yeah. That's what it is. Okay. So a, a little change in x would result in a change in f five times as great. Now, what about the change in g relative to a change in f? What about the change in g relative to a change in f? So here's our, now our change in f. And f is going into g. So now we've got a change in f. How much will g change? Three times that, right? Does it make sense? Changes in f are five times changes in x. Changes in g are three times changes in f based on these rates that are given. So this function changes how much relative to a, a given change in x? 15 times. Do you see that? So if we change the input of this function a little bit, change in x, the output will change 5 times 3 as much, times as much. Sorry. Okay, let me just let that, that soak in for a second. If the rate of change of f is 5, then changes, the change in y will be 5 times the change in x. If the rate of change of g with respect to its input, in this case f, is 3, then changes in g will be 3 times changes in f. So here's one change in the input, and that results in a change in the output of g of three times as much. So now looking from start to finish, if we change the composite function by an amount delta x, how much will the output change? So changes, in this case, changes in g of f of x equal 15 times changes in x. So this is, this is backing up the point that it's not just, we looked at that e to the 1 over x, it's not just, based on our hypothesis, it would have just been, the rate of change just would have been 3. But there's more to it, right? Because you have this function f changing with respect to x as well. So it's the product of the two. OK. Does it make sense? Really important idea. OK, so f and g are functions having rate of change functions r, f, and r, g. Then the rate of change function for the corresponding composition is? So this is what we did. We just did this first. Okay. First we did the rate of change of f with respect to x. And then we multiplied it by the rate of change of g with respect to f. That's exactly what we just showed. So the rate of change of the, don't worry about what they'll say, we'll just, it's just what I just said. Okay, so here's another form of that using the prime notation, but remember prime notation still means rate of change. Okay, so notice that it's not the rate of change of g with respect to x times the rate of change of f with respect to x. Okay, you've got to do the rate of change of g leaving that interior function as it is. So this is now this rule that we need to find these rate of change functions.
for composite, rate of change for a composite function. We're going to take the rate of change of the exterior function, leaving the interior function as it is. And then we're going to multiply that by the rate of change of the interior function, right? F was interior, G was exterior. So rate of change of the exterior, leaving the interior as it is, times the rate of change of the interior function. Okay, so let's go back to our examples. These. So now we've got We want the rate of change, so I'll use, uh, I'll use the prime. We want the rate of change of g of f of x and we found that that was what? <clears throat> The rate of change of G of, so here, yeah, so of F of X, not of the rate of change of F, okay, and not of X, but just F times rate of change of F. This was like our, this was like our five in that example, and this was like our three. But first we had to, the changes in F were five times the changes in X. Changes in G were three times changes in F. So that's why we need to identify what, what is G and what is F to apply this. Okay, so for this one, what was G? The interior function? Sorry, F. F is the interior function. What is it? X Q minus 5. Exterior function? Okay. So... Therefore, h, the rate of change of h with respect to x is going to be, we're going to look at, we're going to take the rate of change of the exterior function, leaving the interior as it is. So, what's the rate of change of the exterior function? We found this on Friday before we left. 1 over 2 times square root. What's going to be in the square root? F as it is. F as it is. Did you catch it? So that what I just wrote was this right here. The rate of change of G leaving the interior function as it is. What's the where we get the one over two? Friday before spring break. That's what we derived. We were derived the rule for the square root of X. That's the Friday before break we did that. Okay? Are we done? No. Nope. Times? Times the rate of change of the interior function, which is the rate of change of f. Rate of change is? 3x squared. So that's the rate of change of h of x. Okay, so what I want you to do is practice on the remaining three. See how these go. Take a couple minutes to find the rate of change of P with respect to X, the rate of change of V with respect to X, the rate of change of Q with respect to X. See how you do on those. If you've got a question, you can stop me if I come around.
translation. With a hodem. This is not. Remember, so it's going to be the, it's going to be the, the rate of change of G with a as it is. So how we change it? There you go. That's it. Yeah, that's it. change for ln of x is? Yes, we do. Yeah, inside. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to write some, some more common rules that we just don't have all the time to derive. We don't have time to derive everyone in class. So I'm just going to write a bunch out here. So, um, Rate of change of natural log of x is 1 over x. Natural, or the rate of change of sine x, cosine x. change of cosine is negative sine. What else? Log base b of x is 1 over times ln of b. Okay, so let's do these. So the G function is the exterior function. And so what is the rate of change of E to the something? E to the something. And we're going to leave that interior function as it is. Are we done? No. Times the rate of change of the interior function, which is? That's the rate of change of p, e to the 3x to the 8th times 24x to the 7th. Okay? What is the outer function here? 1 over x, which is like x to the minus 1. Rate of change? Negative. So now, so it's going to be negative to the... Negative 2, right? The power rule on negative 1. Bring the negative in front. Reduce the power by 1. What goes inside the parentheses? Keep the interior function as it is. Then, times the rate of change of the interior function, which is? So if we wanted to clean this one up, we could do negative 1 over x times ln x squared.
Okay. If if you're ask me if I lost you. So ask me a question if I lost you on either of these two first examples. Anyone need help? Go ahead. On the second one. So it's the x to the negative one is equal to. That's the exterior function, right? That's what we're plugging ln of x into. So remember before we said that the two functions were x to the minus one and ln of x. So g of f of x would be this function, 1 over ln of x. So rate of change of g is power rule, leaving the interior function as it is. Then times the rate of change of the interior function, which is this one I just gave you, 1 over x. Yes. Yep. Okay, what about this one? Exterior function is? So the rate of change? Cosine. So what I told you up here, the rate of change is cosine? Cosine of what? The interior function. Times? Negative x to the minus 2. The rate of change of the interior function. Yes, ma'am. Nope. No, we want to get. We want to just make sure we get the initial thing, the initial 